What's up, everybody? I'm DJ Six Smith. You're watching the Sit Down. JJ's here with us. John Marshall Jones. What's up, man? What's up, DJ? I am doing well. It is great to be talking to you. How's everything? Well, listen, it's great to be talking. Yeah, true. Yeah, hear me on this. Um, a lot of people are going through some really tough times, and we're able to have an interview, and both of us are healthy. And I'm sending you, you know, love that your family's healthy. And to everybody who's watching this, um, if you're healthy, and you can pay the bills and you got a little something to eat, be rem remember to look at the good side, right? It's not all gloom and doom if you're all right right now. And just keep focusing on the best part of your life, which is your happiness, your family, all of that good stuff, and everything else can work itself out. Yeah, amen to all that. And it's nice to be able to talk about some stuff besides coronavirus. And, you know, when I think about your career, I mean, You've been at this thing for a while, so what's been like building this thing out the last couple of decades? Well, um, it's been an interesting journey. First off, um, I get to do what I love and I get paid for it. And a lot of it is just acting silly in a script. So anybody who can act silly and get paid for it, it's a great job. You're like, sign me up for that. I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and there's been a lot of lessons learned along the way because um, when you're working independently, you're not going in nine to five. You have to go in and you have to win the job each time. And then after you win the job, you have to show the people that are there that they didn't make a mistake in hiring you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are opportunities for all of your baggage to come out at some point. And you have to learn how to manage that because people are going to say things that piss you off. They're going to say things that insult you. And you're going to have to be able to handle that and handle it in such a way that you keep your professional relationships intact. And um, what people don't understand about the actor's life is maybe about 1% of all the actors that are doing it, maybe less than 1%, actually become stars, mm -hmm. right? So that means that um, people are calling them and offering them money to come in and do the work. The rest of us, we got to go out and get the job. And those jobs, it may be a day, it may be a week, maybe it's two months, but eventually you're going to be unemployed again. And so you're unemployed many times, maybe most of the year. And so you're spending your time trying to figure out how to manage the time when you're unemployed and how to not let that turn into a thing that you're not working right now so that you carry that into the next job interview. You got to come into every interview like, hey, uh, I'm working all the time and you're lucky to have me. Mm. And I'm here to solve your problem, which is that you have this role that you have to fill and you haven't filled it yet because you got me here. <laughs> so I'm here to help you. And if you can keep that kind of mentality going, um, you're always going to bring good energy into the room. And that good energy is what people feel when you're in there. And more than the performance, they're actually hiring the energy and the confidence that means they're going to be able to work along with you without any problems. Yeah, is this guy going to be a good hang? Is he going to cause any problems? Yeah. Like that's a big part of the whole deal here. Yeah, yeah. And they don't explain that to you in acting school. Mm. Yeah, you have right? to find that one out on the fly, right? Yeah, you got you to gotta mess up some relationships mm. before you understand how valuable that part of this is. So how long did it take to really understand that? Like how many years into the business were you like, okay, oh. this is what it's all about? Shit, till last week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, listen... It, my real turnaround was um, after my 50th birthday, mm -hmm. because I'd been trying to position myself to be a leading man star for 20 years. And it didn't matter what I did or how good the performance was, because nobody was really interested in seeing me in that way. Mm -hmm. And after my 50th birthday, there were a couple of things that came up for leading man type stuff where I realized that I was just too old for that. It wasn't going to make sense to have somebody my age doing that. It just wouldn't look authentic. And when I realized that, I realized that 
I was no longer in competition with the leading men. So I didn't have to waste any more energy trying to be that. I could just be myself. And when I decided to just be myself, which now I'm like the authority figure, right? I'm no longer the handsome leading man. I'm the guy <laughs> that looks over his glasses at you <laughs> and asks you what you're thinking about. Mm -hmm. I know you didn't just do that. <laughs> so, and you can dominate that role. Like you can and, thrive and, in that role. And I can thrive. And, and my career changed. As soon as I kind of gave into, I stopped coloring my hair and just mm -hmm. let a little gray come in and you know, uh, and just, you know, wore the glasses when I needed to read them, use them to read. And I became an authority figure. And when I accepted myself for who I am, not for who I wanted to be, but for who I am, my career took off all over again. That's a really amazing thing or who the industry is trying to make you to be. So like, what are some of the parts like after all that happens that you're like, wow, this is great. Like I finally get to let myself fly here. Um, I did a role on a series called Rectify. Uh, mm -hmm. The role was uh, called, the character's name was Pickle. And Pickle had been in prison for 25 years mm -hmm. and he just got out. Now he's in a halfway house and he's trying to readjust to life but he's got to carry this bag with him of being a 25 year fella. And part of what they were teaching in the halfway house is you got to go in the job interview and you got to tell the truth. And that journey that that man had over the course of a season of being turned down over and over again and how it made him feel about himself. And finally the day that he got the job, the first thing he wanted to do, was call his mother. Mm. So here's a man in his mid fifties that still feels a connection to not disappointing his mother. Wow. You know, and it was, and I never thought of um, guys that have been incarcerated and were coming back, back out into the world that they still have all of these human connections and expectations that we all do. They just have an additional burden now that uh, that can define them if they let it. And this was, uh, in this particular case, uh, he had uh, enough intestinal fortitude not to allow it to define him. Mm. And uh, I thought that was a, a great story and hopefully was inspirational to anybody who's going through the same thing. Yeah, it's really cool to be able to play a role like that. And, you know, even going back a little bit, like when I think about you on Smart Guy and playing the father figure there, like that may have been a kid's show, but that was a really impactful role because of who that character was, what he represented to that family, and also what he represented to the black community too at that time too. At that time, uh, the predominant image of black fathers was the deadbeat daddy, mm -hmm. that he just did not take care of his kids. And so to have a show on the air with the first ever black genius with a loving, protective father who was holding his family together as a unit um, was, was more impactful than any of us realized at the time. Yeah. And the, the thing is a couple things. One is whenever I travel, there's some young man in his, you know, middle 30s, early 40s, that comes up to me and says, hey, I just got to tell you something. I didn't have a dad in my mm -hmm. house when I grew up, and you were the dad I wished I had, and you had an incredible impact on my life. And every one of those young men, you can see, is smart and articulate, and he's doing well in adjusting to adulthood in America. Mm -hmm. So to have that kind of impact on the kind of numbers of people that were watching the show because yes it was a kid's show but there were two or three million people a week yeah watching those the show two or three million then. kids yeah. yeah and those were great numbers at that time mm -hmm. um and the second the second thing is that uh i went to the Cannes film festival a couple of years ago with a film i produced called the last revolutionary and when i arrived in Cannes, uh there is a robust afro-european community mm. and those young brothers looked at me like I was Denzel Washington. 